This is Wraith from Wraith Rain. I'm an author of serialized gay romance fiction. Every week on this podcast, I'll be reading a chapter from one of my gay fantasy shifter serials called Dragon's Rain. I'll explain at the break how you can find out more about this story and others I write. So let's get to it. Chapter 7. Can't Go Home Again So, are you ever going to tell me your name? Caden asked the girl in yellow and black, who led him through a maze of tunnels and stairwells with squashy, unrecognized piles of debris that clung to the corners. There were more than a few times when he'd taken a whiff of those piles and nearly gagged. So the claws have an even easier time hunting me down for helping you? She said without turning around. So I'll just call you granddaughter. No, you will not. This had her whipping around and those strange yellow eyes narrowing at him. Then a name, he said. We're almost to the mid, she growled. And it's just the two of us, so you don't need a name. I'll give you my name, Caden said boldly. She laughed. (laughs) Oh, sure. That has value. It does. I have a lot to lose, too, he squawked. Your name, Dragon Boy? is going to be on everyone's lips in no time flat, because you're going to be caught. She shook her black and yellow hair as she mounted yet another staircase. His thighs were already aching. They'd gone up too many staircases with brutal huge steps that they practically had to climb up on their hands and knees as much as put one foot in front of the other. No, it's not, he muttered. He had to believe that. Otherwise, he would have to accept what Marban had said that there was no going back, that his old life was gone, and that this new one in front of him, full of fear and the unknowns, was all there was. She stopped, and he was pretty sure it wasn't just to lecture him, but because she was tired too, and turned around to look at him, hands on her hips, a mixture of frustration and anger on her face. I don't believe you're this stupid, she said as she rested against the slimy wall. He was going to warn her about a piece of brown gunk that she backed into, but calling him stupid had him remaining silent. He stayed clear of the walls himself. I'm not. Okay, then why are you acting stupid? He remained silent. She shook her head and poked her tongue against the inside of her cheek. They are going to find you. No, someone will have seen you shift. Someone will recognize you. Someone will have recorded it, she pointed out. Whoever planted the bomb took care of the cameras in the square, he said. He'd been thinking about this. I'm pretty sure anyways. They don't want people to know who they are. And what about the thousands with their cell phones who were filming everything just in case they caught sight of Valerius? Did they block all of those too? Planting that backpack without anyone seeing is one thing, but turning into a freaking huge dragon? She shook her head and wrapped her arms around herself. The claw are many things, but they are very thorough. Even if that person doesn't upload their video to the cloud, they will give it over to the claw. Caden's stomach was in his feet. What she was saying made sense. He rubbed his sweaty palms on his pants. Maybe you're right. I'll get caught. But I still have to try, he told her. Why? Her hands flew up like birds taking flight. Your parents are not going to welcome you with open arms. You don't know my parents, he said stoutly, but then wiped his hands on his pants. Besides, I'm not going to tell them or anyone that I'm a dragon shifter. Her mouth opened as if she truly could not believe his words. How are you going to do that? I'll just not shift, he said. The white dragon was still firmly asleep in his chest, but its ears flickered when the girl let out a shriek of laughter. She actually held her sides as she laughed at him. Annoyance had him glaring at her. What's so funny? Why are you acting like I'm an idiot? He asked, even as he was afraid now he had said something stupid. She waved at him for a moment as the chuckles finally slowed, then stopped. He was happy to see that she leaned against that brown gunk again. In the beginning, at least you don't have any control over when you shift, she explained. Like, no control. He blinked. That sounded bad. It was bad. His whole plan involved him never shifting, or at least only doing so when he was in the wilderness, completely and utterly alone. But if he was shifting randomly, a dragon in the house, a dragon in the shop, uh, yeah, that was a no, a big no. 
Uh, How long is the beginning? A A few days, weeks, a month or so, he asked her. Maybe he could go hiking for a time, get things under control, and then return to the city. One of the things that Valerius had ensured was that there were plenty of wild, empty spaces to get lost in, with city centers heavily built up around them. Her eyebrows rose up with each word he said. Um, how about years? Decades? Centuries? And I'm betting for a dragon shifter that centuries and millennia are more likely. Those words so chilled him that he couldn't speak at first. Her expression went from mocking to concerned. She ran a nervous hand through her hair and ducked her head. For a moment, he saw the girl she had been before she became a swarm shifter. Look, I I could be wrong. I I only know how it was for me and other, you know, lower shifters, she said. We should keep moving. There's a lot of stairs to climb. They climbed in silence. His mind was like a snake eating its own tail. He'd learned nothing other than to have his panic build. There must be a way, he said as they paused at another landing. He felt a change in the light and guessed they were getting near the mid. While he was hungry for daylight after the grim tunnels and stairs, getting to the mid would mean losing the girl's company. And though she was prickly, she was the only shifter he knew. A way to control it. Does your spirit talk to you? She gave him a strange look, but then tapped her chin. Sometimes I think it does. It reacts mostly to my emotions, enhancing them like when I'm angry. It's like a buzz in my mind making me really angry. And when you're happy too? Same thing? He asked hopefully. She considered this and then nodded. Sure, it's like sharing a joke with someone. They laugh so you laugh harder. She then gave him a curious stare and asked, Does your, your spirit talk to you? I can see them, he said. And when she gave him an even more quizzical look, he explained, I I mean, not really see them, but I can see them in my head. Right now, the spirit is curled up and asleep in my chest. They're exhausted. Oh, she seemed perplexed by this. I could hear Valerius talking to his spirit when we were fighting, he confessed to her. He had held this information back before, but now he felt like there was no harm in telling it. His spirit's name is Raziel. His spirit has a name? Her big yellow eyes were huge. More than that, it argues with them. They were arguing, Caden revealed. What were they arguing about? Her voice held genuine curiosity. No longer was there any sneering in it. Me, whether to attack me or not. Valerius didn't want to. Raziel did. He shrugged and gave an uncertain smile. And Raziel convinced Valerius to go after you? She was very still, clearly enraptured with this idea. No, Raziel was in charge. Valerius was shouting at him to stop, but it wouldn't, he explained. She started shaking her head and crossed her arms over his chest. This is really huge. You know that, right? That they were fighting? That Valerius wasn't in control. She practically shouted, then she looked around them to make sure no one was nearby. She lowered her voice. Those human first assholes are constantly trying to say that the spirits are in charge and the humans they take over are enslaved. What you've just said about Valerius, of all people, would make everybody think they're right. But they're, they're not right, right? He asked her. She was giving him that mixture of frustrated and angry look again. How do you not know anything about shifters? Because I wasn't one until today, he gestured at his chest. Why would I have to know anything about shifters? Shifters don't live by me. I'm not friends with any. They never come to the shop. You're really the first one I've ever talked to. Her gaze was distant as she muttered, it really is like we live in different worlds. Lived. I'm in yours now, he reminded her. But she shook her head almost violently. No, you're not. You're a dragon shifter. That puts you into your own category. Hell, even going back to the mid makes you and me from completely different planets. Which, by the way, we're here. She pointed up yet another flight of stairs. He could see a door at the top with sunlight streaming in around the edges. Even though she was driving him crazy and treated him like he was soft in the head at times, he found himself regretting that their time together was over. Give me some tips, he begged her. Seriously, any advice you've got to keep control of the shifting? For a moment, she almost looked helpless and he doubted she let many people see her this way, but the emotions were simply too huge for her to hide. I don't, come on, please, anything, he begged. She shook her head, but said, Don't get angry. 
try to control your fear, meditate or something. Emotions make you lose control, lose control, and you shift. Your spirit, she swallowed, your spirit will protect itself. So if you're angry or afraid, it will want to lash out. Okay, so I've got to keep as calm as possible, he said with a nod. Your eyes are going to shine like fuck, so wear sunglasses, she said. Um, you'll feel pressure in your chest if you're going to shift. If that happens, you need to get the hell away from everybody. He imagined becoming a dragon in the house. It would destroy the whole building. Okay, so wear sunglasses, feel pressure, then get away from people, he repeated. And this sounds crazy, but if what you said is true... Talk to your spirit. Explain what's going on, she said, and then flexed her hands together. Look, the biggest thing you've got to remember is that you were chosen. Her expression was strange, both hopeful and sad. They say that we get the spirit that we deserve. So you deserve to be one of the rarest and most powerful shifters. No matter what Valerius or any of the other dragon shifters think, you're meant to be here. He was touched by our speech. He wished he could believe this was all meant. Well, maybe he could, but not in a good way. He kept thinking it was all set up to simply kill him. Could there be another future where being a dragon shifter was a good thing? Thank you, he told her as he took one step up the stairs. She nodded and made a faint wave before turning to leave. He called out to her, My name is... Dragon Boy, she said with a smile. I'm afraid I'll know it soon enough. Then no harm telling you early. Besides, I think I can trust you with it, he said. Too trusting, dragon boy. She shook her head, but didn't move to leave again. Caden, he said. Caden Bryce. I won't ask your name again. I know you don't. Rose. She crossed her arms over her chest, this time defensively against him, as if he was going to make fun of her. Rose? That's nice. She rolled her eyes. Please. It's pretty. She snorted, but her hold on herself loosened. Yeah, well, I guess. It sort of fits with me turning into bees and all. Intrigued, he asked, can you pollinate flowers? And she glared at him, which had him swallowing, but then she muttered, yeah, of course I can do that. I bet you're a good gardener, he guessed. She rocked a little from side to side. People are really poor in the below, if you know that much about us. So we can't always afford to buy all our food, so gardens are important. So your gift is pretty useful then, he said, smiling genuinely. A momentary trace of pride filled her face, but it was quickly tamped down as she shrugged. It hasn't made me any friends, if that's what you're asking. My vegetables feed a ton of families in the below, but they still avoid me like the plague. I'm sorry, he said. When I realized what kind of shifter you were, I was scared too. Stupid, but I was. At first, she seemed nettled, but then she let out a sigh. <laughs> You know how stupid that sounds, right? You're a dragon who shoots ice out of his mouth, and you were afraid of a girl who can turn into bees? Bees sting when they're mad at you, he said. Her lips twitched into what suspiciously looked like a smile. Yes, we can. But if we sting, we die. Not like wasps. So when individual bees you turn into die, no more questions, dragon boy. I mean, Caden, she said. Next time then, Rose, we'll talk. He pointedly used her name too. She shook her head. You're crazy, but okay. Next time we meet, assuming you're not in prison, I'll tell you all about me. Excellent, he grinned at her. She waved a hand in the air and jogged down the steps. Soon she was out of sight and he was alone again. He felt adrift like a boat in the middle of the ocean with shredded sails and no engine, but he only allowed himself to feel that for a moment. He was nearly home, and if he was going to give his plan a shot, he had to start acting like his normal self once more. All of this, everything that had happened, could be wiped away. He would find a way to control the shift. He would have his old life back. Caden turned and walked up the last stairwell to the door. Light leaked around the edges and through a grate. He took in a breath and peered through the grate. The sunlight was almost blinding. So much had happened since he was in the square at noon that it felt like it should be night already, but it was still bright daylight out. Only a little over an hour had passed. The door led out not too far from his neighborhood. It was a small market area where fresh fruit and vegetables were sold, along with meat, cheese, and bakery goods. The marketplace was normally closed after one, but due to the crowds from the anniversary, everyone was still open. The door looked to be behind one of the fruit vendors. 
even with the scare of the white dragon, he nearly snorted at that. The market was still filled with people talking and bargaining and eating. He didn't see any claw. He pushed the door handle down and opened the door just wide enough for him to slip out. The sunlight hit his face and had him squinting, and the white dragon inside of him stirring slightly, as if the feel of the light and the sight of the sky awakened it. Remembering Rose's advice, he tried to calm his own anxiety about being out in the open, and the dragon spirit flipped back into deep sleep. No one seemed to notice as he left the door and joined the throng of the market. He made his way through the crowd like an eel through thick rushes, and finally escaped the tourists. He half-jogged down the familiar tree-lined streets of West Reach. His heart was suddenly in his throat as he caught sight of the two-story colonial he lived in with his parents and sister. The blue shutters and white siding were as familiar to him as the back of his hand and were more welcome to him than anything at that moment. Home. He was home. He practically jumped up the steps to the front door. The front door itself was open, but the screen door was closed, and it let out a protesting squeak as he wrenched it open. Caden? It was his sister Tilly's voice. She was shouting, her voice full of anguish. It's me, Till, he called back. Oh my God! She screamed, and suddenly he had an armful of screaming sister. Her arms were around his neck. He felt hot tears against the side of his throat. She was gripping him as if afraid he would disappear like smoke if she didn't. He held her back just as tightly. It's okay. It's okay, he kept telling her. And at that moment, it felt that way. I hope you are enjoying Dragon's Reign so far. If you enjoy the fantasy aspect of Dragon's Reign, you might enjoy my high fantasy serial, The Elven King's Blade. The fantasy spans between our modern human world and a magical one where elves and other immortal beings are real. Here's a summary for The Elven King's Blade. Elven King Athedon and modern human Kirin are unknowingly bonded across realms, but unless they complete the bond, they will die. Discovering his blade is human is impossible for Athedon to accept. For Kieran's part, accepting his fate is to save an elven kingdom is just as hard to take. If you want to check out the Elven King's Blade, the first five chapters are free to read. A link in the description is down below. When you called, and then you went there, and then the bomb and the dragon, oh God, Caden, I thought you died, she sobbed. And so had he. At that moment, their mother was in the doorway behind her. She was clutching a dish towel. Her expression was wrenched, but then it smoothed out, even though he could tell she'd been worried too. Caden, you gave your sister and me a fright. We were thinking, well, it doesn't matter. You're safe and it was all a scare for nothing, she said as she dried her hands before coming over to tousle his hair. Tilly would not let him go, so she had to reach around his sister to kiss his cheek. I know, I'm sorry. There was a a bomb and... I lost my phone and wallet and clothes and humanity and, oh God, mom, I can't tell you any of that. So he said nothing more, just leaving it vague. But she was already nodding and filling in the blanks just as he hoped she would. Yes, yes, Tilly and I have been watching it on television. I'm so glad that you were able to get home. Your father is trapped downtown. He doesn't know when he's going to get back tonight. Tilly, though, had not recovered so quickly like their mother had but their mother believed that nothing could really go wrong. Nothing awful would happen to them, and she refused to dwell on bad things that were simply not going to happen. Their father was the worry wart, probably because he was a litigator and saw every day how things could and did go wrong. Um, are we going to have to wait for him for dinner then? Caden asked, his stomach turning in on itself with hunger. Her eyebrows raised. Dinner? It's only 1.30 in the afternoon, Caden. A little early to be thinking about dinner, isn't it? I didn't really get to eat anything except yogurt this morning, he confessed. Well, there's fixing for sandwiches in the fridge. I've got to head to the face center now that I know all of my family is safe. She crushed his cheek, a certain softness entering her practical demeanor, which allowed him to see how scared for him that she had been, but would not acknowledge even to herself. Why are you going there? Caden asked, even as he cuddled his little sister who remained silent, watching and listening to their exchange. She'd actually fingered some of the clothes he was wearing and a frown had crossed her face. For the new dragon shifter, their mother explained, 
as she pulled on a light jacket. His stomach suddenly did a physically impossible thing in his chest that felt rather like a double axle. Oh, I mean, what exactly are you going to do for him or her? Pray to the spirits to calm things down and care for them, of course, she said. This new spirit must be terrified after the reception they received from Valerius. His heart lifted a little. So you think Valerius was wrong in attacking the white dragon? You don't think they had anything to do with the bomb? Spirits are all about life, honey, not death. I'm afraid that bomb was likely something set up by humans first, she sighed. Even as he felt that swelling of hope, he heard Rose in his head telling him that maybe his mother only felt that way because she didn't think that the white dragon was in her house, in her son. Valerius didn't exactly think so, he found himself pointing out. Well, dragons are territorial, honey, and it was as likely as much a shock to him as it was to the person who became the white dragon. And with the bomb and all, she waved a hand. There was a lot going on. Things will get better. You'll see. Everything will be as it should be. The spirits will provide. Make sure you stir the stew every once in a while or we'll have black and stew for dinner, as I assume you're staying here and not going back to work. He was not going anywhere near the square, though he would have to contact Wally and Landry to let them know he was all right. No, I- I'm here. Don't think that the square is going to be open much more today, he said. Good. Well, enjoy yourselves, you two. She bust his cheek one last time, kissed the top of Tilly's spiky head, and then she was out the door, leaving just him and his sister. Having his mother seem so calm and sure, not to mention being home, made him feel like the afternoon's events really had been a dream, and that things could truly go back to what they had been. He looked down at Tilly. She was staring up at him studying him, and not saying anything. Hey, uh, you know, want something to eat? He asked her, smoothing a hand over her head. Okay, she said, her voice soft and uncertain. She slipped her hand through his like she used to when she was little, and accompanied him into the bright, friendly kitchen. His mother loved plants and herbs and all sorts of growing things. Their backyard was a riot of color, and the kitchen wasn't much better with pots of herbs in every available space and flowers drying in bunches for her homemade potpourris hung from the ceiling in between the bronze cookware. Lamb stew was bubbling on low on the stove. He stirred it as their mother requested before heading over to the refrigerator to get sandwich fixings out. Tilly had let go of his hand reluctantly, but then seated herself at the kitchen island, her barefoot feet swinging back and forth almost nervously. She has no idea that anything is actually wrong, he thought. She's probably too strung out after that phone call we had. That's all that's wrong. Ham or turkey for your sandwich, or should we go crazy and have both? He asked with his head stuck in the refrigerator. Mom made those pretzel rolls you like, and why are you wearing those clothes? They aren't yours. Tilly interrupted him as if he'd said nothing at all. He swallowed, grabbing both kinds of lunch meat, mayo, mustard, Swiss cheese, and tomato slices, before emerging from the refrigerator. He didn't look at her as he answered, In all the chaos, my clothes got messed up, so I had to put on these. Why aren't you wearing ones from the shop? She persisted. Wally would have given you stuff from the shop to wear, not not rags like those. Hey, these are not rags. They're recycled and they're fine, thanks. He cut open a pretzel roll and proceeded to smear mustard and mayo on it before piling with both ham and turkey, some cheese and tomato. He was tempted to just devour the whole sandwich and make his sister another one. He was so freaking hungry. The white dragon was shifting in his chest, hungry too. But he resisted the urge and put that sandwich before her. He was even more hungry when he saw that she didn't touch it. He quickly turned back to the counter to make another one. You saw the bomber, Caden, she said with surprising clarity and adult determination. She emphasized each word by wrapping her knuckles on the island's wooden top. You were going after the bomb. People are saying that it was a young guy who jumped off of the drop, that he was trying to save everybody from Tilly. I did not. You saw the bomb. Her voice was steady. Her eyes, though, were filled with tears. I saw it in your face. You thought you were going to die. He met her gaze and swallowed. Till. You were the one, she whispered. You were the one that took the bomb to the drop. You jumped. Mom wouldn't believe me because she didn't want to believe you were gone, except 
You aren't gone. I know it was you. His hands moved to the edge of the countertop. His fingernails dug into the wood. And you think, what, that I... Out of the corner of his eye, he caught sight of the television that was mounted in the wall by the sink. His mother had had it on low, but she'd clearly been watching the news, worried about him after Telly's words. They were showing the front of Wally's shop. The Dragon King and a phalanx of claw were walking into the place. The reporter was saying something breathlessly that he couldn't hear and didn't need to. He's already found me, Caden thought. Rose, you were right. I was stupid. There is no going home again. Everything is different. His sister saw where he was looking, and she asked, Are you the white dragon shifter, Caden? I hope you enjoyed this week's chapter. If you want to read ahead in Dragon's Reign or read the many other stories hosted there, you can purchase a membership to get access to WraithRain.com. Or you can continue to listen along here for free. If you'd like to learn more about WraithRain.com and me, there's a link in the description down below. 